worship, if you come the next Sunday, you'll see we have all of here is youth, drummers, <laughs> guitarists, musicians, singers. A lot of them are the youth, and we thank God for the youth because the scripture says, let no man despise thy youth. And I thank God that God has blessed us with a pastor who has a heart for youth and gives the youth many opportunities to work. We have youth working as ushers and all throughout the church. But I also thank God that there's place for us older ones <laughs> who, you know, even though the youth are doing a lot, we still have a place and God has a place for us as well. And so we thank God for the privilege of serving him. Amen. Um, this morning's message is taken from Luke 18. You all bear with me because I told Brother Virgil I'm using technology today. I'm so not about this, but I said, okay, Lord, I'm going to stretch and be different instead of printing out because I like my paper. I like paper. I'm not a computer person. I like, um, I'm very old school. I'm very old fashioned. I act older than I am, but I just can't help myself. I'm just used to the generation. I like paper. I like to be able to touch. And this screen thing is just, I'm not about it, but I'm going to try it just because of the fact that it's important for us as body of believers that we're open to change because in order for us to embrace the newness of what God is wanting to do in us and through us we have to be able to accept change amen and change is a good thing it's not a bad thing and I want to encourage us to be open to change amen all right so let's stand for the reading of God's word I'm reading from Luke chapter 18 verses 1 through 14 and the word of the Lord reads, Then he spoke a parable to them that men always ought to pray and not lose heart, saying, There was in a certain city a judge who did not fear God nor regard man. Now there was a widow in that city, and she came to him saying, Get justice for me from my adversary. And he would not for a while. But afterward he said within himself, Though I do not fear God nor regard man, Yet, because this widow troubles me, I'll avenge her, lest by her continual coming she weary me. Then the Lord said, Hear what the unjust judge said. And shall God not avenge his own elect who cry out day and night to him, though he bears long with them? I tell you that he will avenge them speedily. Nevertheless, when the Son of Man comes, will he really find faith on the earth? Also, he spoke this parable to some who trusted in themselves that they were righteous and despised others. Two men went up to the temple to pray, one a Pharisee and the other a tax collector. The Pharisee stood and prayed thus with himself, God, I thank you that I'm not like any other men, extortioners, unjust adulterers, or even as this tax collector. I fast twice a week, I give tithes of all that I possess, and the tax collector standing afar off would not so much as raise his eyes to heaven, but beat his breast, saying, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. I tell you, this man went down to his house justified, rather than the other, for everyone who exalts himself will be humbled, and he who humbles himself will be exalted. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, I just thank you for your word today. Thank you for the opportunity, the privilege to stand in your pulpit, Lord God, and speak to your people, Lord God. And I just pray, Lord God, that you'll help me, Lord God, not to add or take away from your word, but speak what thus saith the Lord with power and anointing. I pray that you touch the congregation, that they'll be open to receive your word today, Lord God. Touch the hearts of your people, Lord God. Help us, Lord God, to not allow distraction, Lord God, to get in the way of what it is you're trying to say to us, Lord God, and through us, Lord God. And I just pray, Lord God, that you just minister in a powerful way. Move and work in this church, Lord God. Let your will be done. And when all is said and done, I pray you get the glory, honor, and praise you rightly deserve. Amen? Amen. 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 Let us, um, you may see, be seated, sorry. <laughs> amen, amen, amen. Luke chapter 18, the word of the Lord. I love the word of the Lord. I just love God's word. Amen. And it's so funny because as we were, um, as I was praying about what I was going to share with you all today, the Lord laid on my heart Luke 18. It's funny because for those of us who are part of the prayer um, team, the intercessors, um, Sister Tori was sharing with us about Luke 18 in um, one of our, um, in one of her inspirational messages to us. And as I was, you know, praying and meditating about what to preach this Sunday, the Lord just kept pressing on me, Luke 18, Luke 18. I was like, Lord, Sister Tori already gave that to us, you know? But Luke 18 just would not, <laughs> with, the, with, the, with the, the story of the, the parable of the persistent widow. And why, Lord, why is it that you want me to share this message? You know, um, 
in Luke 18, it's actually cons it has two parables that really talk about prayer. And if you recall, um, earlier on in Luke chapter 11, do you remember the disciples having a conversation with Jesus? Remember what the conversation was about? Well, let me refresh your memory. In Luke chapter 11, and if you want to keep your keep a like a dog ear if you have one these lovely things you can put it here and then turn over to Luke chapter 11 real quick and let's see the conversation Jesus is having with his disciples they said well the word of God says now it came to pass as he was praying in a certain place when he ceased that one of his disciples said to him Lord teach us his pray just as John taught his disciples so he said to them when you pray Say, Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day by day our daily bread, and forgive us our sins, for we also forgive everyone who is indebted to us. And do not lead us into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. So here Jesus gives the disciples a formula of how to pray. Now, a lot of times you'll hear some people just, that's their prayer. They'll just say that prayer. There's nothing wrong with it, but Jesus wasn't saying that this is the prayer. This is how you pray all the time. Anytime you go before the Father, you just say the Our Father prayer. No, what he was giving the disciples was an instruction on how to pray. And in Luke 18, he gives an even bigger illustration of how to pray. He uses the two parables as a way to help the people to understand what God is really saying about prayer. You know, I never looked at the widow, you know, the story of the widow as a prayer. I never even looked at, you know, I knew, of course, the parable of the two men who were praying as a prayer, but not the story of the two widow, of the, of the widow. But it's amazing because if you notice the Our Father, the story of the widow, and even the two men who prayed, they all have one common thing in, one thing in common, and that one common thing is humility before God. Amen? You see, a lot of times there's a tendency, especially in our day and age where we live in, to be very casual with God, very comfortable with God. You know, some people want to refer to God as, oh, that's my buddy, that's my boy, that's my this, that, and the other. But we forget sometimes that God is reverent. He's omnipotent, omniscient, all-powerful, and we cannot just address him any old way. And if you notice in the parable, the two parables, and in the Our Father, Jesus was demonstrating, because anybody, if anyone was close to the Father, anybody who was close to God, it was Jesus. But if you notice, every time he went to God in prayer, was he saying, hey, God, you know you my man, right? No, he wasn't doing that. What was he saying? He said, our Father, which art in heaven. Lord, he always addressed God appropriately. He always addressed God humbly, asking him for forgiveness of any wrong or transgression. Notice the pattern that Jesus is giving us as a body of believers, that when we go before the throne of grace, we don't just blast into the throne room letting God know what we're here, but we come to him humbly, respectfully, and penitently before him. I'm going to skip over for a few minutes from the widow in Luke 18 and look over at the Pharisee. This was amusing actually to hear how he was praying. If you notice what he says, he says, here two men in verse 9, also he spake this parable of some who trusted themselves that they were righteous and despised others. Two men went up to the temple to pray, one a Pharisee and the other a tax collector. The Pharisee stood and prayed thus with himself, God, I thank you. I am not like other men, extortioners, unjust, adulterers, or even as this tax collector. I fast twice a week. I give tithes of all that I possess. And the tax collector now, so I notice his prayer. Notice what he's saying. Look at me, God. Look how wonderful I am. I tithe regularly. I fast regularly. I give. And notice what he says. I'm better than this person. The puffed up attitude in which he approaches God. If you notice, there's no repentance in his mind. Do you think that the Pharisee had any sin? Well, he gave his tithes, though, right? And he was also, uh, what else does it say about him? He was fasting, right? So he's fasting. He's giving his tithes. He's doing all the right things. So what sin does he have? 
It's glaringly obviously, isn't it? Pride, right? And what does the word of God say? Pride goes before destruction, Holy Spirit before fall. And we forget sometimes that even in our pride and our self-righteousness, that can keep us from the presence of God. So we can be doing all of the right things, but still be in the wrong relationship with God. That's why we always have to go before God humbly and recognizing that our righteousness is as, fi as filthy rags before him. If you notice what Paul, you know, notice what this Pharisee did. He was throwing all of his accolades, all of his great accomplishments in God's face. Look at how great I am, as if God didn't know already. God knew what he was doing, but God wanted it to be understood that he's not impressed with your pedigree. He's not impressed with your accomplishments. What impresses him more than anything is your humbleness before him. Amen? Because God wants us to come before him with a broken spirit and a contrite heart. He doesn't want us coming to him with all of the great things that we have, all the wonderful things that we have going on. God is wanting us to have a humble spirit before him. Well, why? What's wrong with having a little pride? You know, it's okay, isn't it, to be happy about your accomplishments? There's nothing wrong with celebrating your accomplishments. There's nothing wrong with being happy and celebrating what God has done in your life. The problem comes in is when you start thinking yourself more than you ought to, and then you start the comparison game and start saying you're better than other people. Because notice what happened in the heart of the Pharisee. His mind was so set on how great he was that he felt like he walked on war. You ever notice those people who are on you know, the high end of society. It happens to sports heroes. It happens to uh, uh, musicians and artists and actresses and actors. If you notice, they get to a certain pinnacle of success and they start thinking that they can just walk on water. They can say anything and do anything and nothing can touch them until, of course, they break the law and they realize how truly human they are. And guess what? They're locked up or what have you. Even with the Pharisee, here he is is standing before God and saying this lovely prayer, but what happens a few passages later? He's involved in the crucifixion of Jesus Christ. And what ends up happening later on? That very sin ends up hurting his children, because what ends up happening is all of the sins that they had done towards Jesus, judgment came to their children in the destruction in 70 AD with the um, temple being destroyed. So here, the way they're thinking, okay, that's what the diff that's what's so dangerous about pride. That's why we have to be so careful and guard against the pride that will well up in us and cause us to think that of ourselves more than we ought to. We have to remember as a body of believers that everything God does, we give him thanks for. If For the very breath that we breathe, we need to give God thanks. For the very shoes on our feet, we give God thanks. When we're, Whatever we have, whatever we accomplish in life, we have to humble ourselves on a regular basis and give God thanks. Recognize that we're nothing in God's presence. We have nothing. We are nothing without him. You know what happens when we die? We become what? dust, right? We're here today and gone tomorrow, you know? Our na you know, in about 500 years, our name wouldn't even be remembered. Did you know that? In fact, I was just talking with um, Missy and Mike about a few weeks ago, and we were just talking about the history of how, um, you know, with how they're able to define, you know, if someone really existed in history or not. It's by the fact that if they're written about 500 years later. That's what makes Shakespeare valid rather than a phantom of our imagination because of the fact that he was written about 500 years. That's a threshold. You have to be written about 500 years after you've died in order for you even be remembered. So think about that. In our world, a hundred, if you don't have children or grandkids or anybody to carry on your memory or your name, you're forgotten in 500 years, except by our Father in heaven. He never forgets us. He always remembers us. He's always concerned about us. So this passage is reminding us of how not to pray. <laughs> Amen. Notice the difference with the extortioner. In some passages, it talks about him as being a tax collector. Tax collectors were hated in that time frame. Why? Because of the fact that they were always getting, you know, asking for more money than they should from the people that they were supposed to be collecting the taxes for, from, from, for Caesar. If you notice the tax collector, notice the, the, the parallel. The religious person is all filled up with 
something puffed up with pride. But notice the, uh, the tax collector. He says, and the tax collector standing afar off would not so much as raise his eyes to heaven, but beat his breast saying, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. I tell you, this man went down to his house justified rather than the other. Isn't it amazing? The one who was beating his, now this is the tax collector, the most hated individual in Jerusalem, and yet he went home justified. Yet the Pharisee, the most revered and respected person in Jerusalem, did not go away justified. You know why? Because, again, it's a heart. God is a reader of hearts. He's not concerned with our actions. He's more concerned with our heart. He'd rather you keep your tithe if you're going to have a wrong attitude about it. He'd rather you stay at home if you're going to be coming to church with the attitude about it. He'd rather you eat a meal rather than fasting and thinking yourself more than you ought to. God is wanting us to recognize that he's a heart reader. He's not about what we're, our actions are. Although, when your heart is right, those things follow through. But you don't need constant congratulations about what you're doing. When, you're, when your heart is right, you can fast and you don't have to bring attention to yourself because God knows. Because what does he say in his word? Those things you do in secret, he rewards you openly. But when you're going around to, oh, I'm, I lost 15 pounds. I just, oh, I can't eat. I have to, oh, I'm fasting. I'm doing this fast for my church. Guess what? Who gets the glory? I do. <laughs> God doesn't get any glory out of that. When I'm, you know, all dramatic about my fasting, guess what? God doesn't get any glory about it. But when I humble myself before the Lord and I get into my secret place and I fast before him and I prostrate myself before him, those things that I do in secret, that's what he rewards openly. And that is what God is wanting us to remember today, that it's not so much about your actions, it's about your attitude in the way that you're approaching him. Amen? Flipping back to the widow in Luke chapter 18, notice what happens here. Here you have this widow who's going before the unjust judge, okay, who knew not God and knew not man, and yet she continually was putting before him her petition, asking him to avenge her of her, um, you know, of her adversary. So here she is constantly going before the judge. And if you notice, it never says how often she did, no, or how long she's been doing it. It just is that she did it a lot. <laughs> but if you notice, even in the widow's attitude, you can kind of infer that she had a bit of, she had a reverence towards the judge. Because how many of you know, if you're going before the judge disrespectfully, you will never see that judge again, amen? <laughs> but obviously, we can infer that this, this widow knew how to approach the judge, that she was able to go before him on a regular basis and advocate for her, her, for her need. Notice her attitude again. She was able to be in the judge's presence because nobody's going to allow someone annoying in their presence if they're being disrespectful, if they're being haughty, if they're being prideful in their presence. But notice what this, the characteristics of, the characteristic of this widow. She kept going before the judge and kept going before the judge and kept asking the judge and asking the judge until she finally got what she was looking for. Why? What does this have to do with prayer? You know, when I was growing up, and I don't know if anybody has ever heard this, you're only supposed to pray once. If you pray more than once, then that means you don't have faith and your faith is lacking. That's what I used to hear when I was growing up. But it's so funny because Jesus was the one who gave this parable. And he was letting us know that it's not necessarily about how many times, you know, that you ask. In fact, you can ask as many times you want. If you notice, even with the Our Father prayer, that's a prayer that we are praying on a regular basis. It's not a one-time prayer and that's it. It's a regular basis. What Jesus was trying to demonstrate to us is that prayer is a constant communication with God. It's not a one-time thing where you just say, okay, God, and then you never hear from God again. I share it all the time. How many of you would be in relationships very long? if all you did was talk to that person, that spouse, once. Would you be in that relationship long? 
I doubt it. Not in a marriage, not in a dating relationship. You would never be in a relationship long if you're only communicating once in a while. But if you notice with this woman, she kept continually pestering this judge until she got what she wanted. You know, I was listening to the radio and they were talking about children. All the kids, raise your hand. Kids, are there any kids in the building? Any kids? Yeah, I love how Sophia raised her hand proudly. That's right. Represent the kids. If you notice, guess what? Did you know that there was a study that showed that you all get what you want from your parents? Guess how kids, they said 600 to 700 students went around interviewed by these, um, these college students. They were interviewed, and they asked them, how do you get what you want? They, they asked them, do you get what you want from your parents? 55% said yes, they get exactly what they want from their parents. So the, the studies, the researchers say, well, how is it that you all get what you want from your kids? Maris, how do you get what you want from your kid, from your mom? You don't know? Sophia, how do you get what you want from your mom? You want help? I'll tell you how. They ask, and they ask, and they ask, and they ask, and they nag, and they nag, and they press, and they press, and they continue asking, and asking, and asking, until guess what? They get what they want. But we think, oh, I prayed that God will help me with this situation, and he didn't do it, so I'm not praying about it anymore. And we think we're going to get what we But the kids, notice what Jesus does over here in Luke chapter uh, 18, verse 15. Notice in verse 15, I didn't cover this passage, but I want to. It says, then they also brought infants to him that he might touch them. But when the disciples saw it, they rebuked them. But Jesus called them to him and said, Let the children come to me, and do not forbid them, for of such is the kingdom of God. Assuredly, I say to you, whoever does not receive the kingdom of God as a little child will, be na, will, be, will by no means enter it. Remember what I said about the kids? What do they do when they want something? They ask, and they ask, and they ask. And notice what Jesus is saying here. In order for us to enter into the kingdom of God, we have to be like the children. So when you pray about something, you keep asking, you keep praying, you keep reading, you keep interceding. You continue to ask and believe God for what it is you're searching for until you get your breakthrough. We sometimes give up too soon or give up too quickly because of the fact that we're not getting our breakthrough fast enough or we don't feel like God is moving fast enough or we feel like, oh, God has forgotten or God doesn't care or God's not concerned or God's got bigger problems. God is concerned. Many of you as parents, you have bigger concerns or bigger problems, but yet, because that kid keeps nagging you, you just give it to them just to get them out of your hair, right? If we, being evil, know how to give good things to our children, how much more does our Father in heaven desire to give good things to us? What God is driving home to us with the story of the, of the widow is the importance of asking. Don't give up on God, because he doesn't give up on us. He loves us with an everlasting love. If you notice with God, he is relentless when it comes to us. He goes after us with a vengeance. He doesn't sleep. He doesn't eat. His concern more than anything is that we reach salvation. Amen? God has a love for us that is everlasting and eternal, and he wants nothing but good things for us, and he wants us to understand as a body of believers that he has greater things than we can possibly imagine. But many of the things we're cheated from, the many of the things that we don't end up realizing our blessing is because of the fact that we get locked into believing that this is all I'm ever going to have. This is all I'm ever going to be. This is all I'm ever going to accomplish. You know why? Because we get tired, we get weary, and we stop asking. As we get older, we stop losing that, we start losing that childlike faith and believing God for the impossible. We stop thinking that God is able to do exceedingly abundantly above all we ask or think. We get one little disappointment or the one major disappointment and all of a sudden God's not God. 
but we have to remember as a body of believers, God is calling us and challenging us as a body of believers to not give up on him, to continue to ask, continue to pray, continue to read, continue to intercede, continue to seek after him with our whole heart until we can get our breakthrough. Amen? I was at work today, or actually it was Friday, and it was so funny because um, I was talking with the campus manager. And, she was, and what had happened was one of our faculty members had passed away. The faculty member, she had been um, a music teacher, teaching piano for about 30, 40 years at the school. And so when she passed away, um, it was really devastating to the school. And one of the fellow faculty members was really heartbroken by the loss of this faculty member. So the campus manager, under the instruction of the senior executive member, cleaned out the office where the faculty member who had, was deceased once occupied. They took all of the things out that she had. She had books, she had flowers, she had pictures and all kinds of little trinkets in that little studio of hers. And of course, when a person dies, you know, they clear out everything. So they just put a memorial picture up there of the woman. And so the faculty member, who was the friend of the one who died, was not happy. So she went to the campus manager and said, where is everything? Why, she's Russian, why you put everything away? Why you put everything away? And she said, well, you know, I'm following the instructions of the senior executive, and they said, you know, we have to take everything out. She's like, no, but you have to put it all back. Put the flowers back, put everything back. She's like, well, I'm sorry, I'm under instructions. I have to do what, she's like, no, but you need to put it back. So she, the, the woman went to the senior, executive who made the decision senior executive said sorry no ma'am we can't you know we're, we're you know we understand you know you you loved your friend and this that and the other but we're using that we have a picture of well this faculty member was not happy so guess what would happen every two weeks she would come by to the campus manager and say you know it would be nice if we had the pictures up on the wall just a thought, just a thought. Don't worry, no worry, not now, no hurry, no hurry. I know where the pictures are. You can just get them from upstairs. And she's like, okay, the campus manager said. Two weeks later, come by. You know, this is the faculty member, it would be nice to have some flowers. You know, some flowers, some flowers in that, in that studio. You know, I know where the flowers are. They're upstairs. You could just go get them down. You don't have to do it. Not, not now, no worry, no worry. But just when you're ready, you know? And so she's like, okay, that's a good idea. We, we'll probably take that consideration. Another two weeks went by. You know, it'd be nice to have some pictures. You know, some pictures, you know. The books, the books, that's what she said. The books, the books. It'd be nice to have the books. So this was going on for weeks and weeks at a time, wearing the campus manager down. The campus manager came to me one day and she said, this woman will not stop. She keeps coming to me week after week about this studio and wanted me to put everything back. If I hear from this woman one more time, I'm ready to just give, and just give her everything she wants. I'm going to put everything back the way it was and call it a day. And I started laughing because I said, you know what? You need to read the story of the persistent widow in Luke 18. And why I thought that was so funny was the fact that this faculty member, she loved her friend so much that she refused to let her memory and everything die with her. She was determined that she was going to put everything back and have everything back where it was supposed to be. And it's so funny because the campus manager was hard-hearted. She was not putting anything back in that studio that was already cleaned out. You know how it is, we cleaners. Once we clean things out, it's cleaned out, and we're not putting anything back. But she was so tired of this woman constantly coming to her about these pictures and these books and all these things that she finally just was ready to give in to her just to get her off her back. And it just is a reminder to us that as a body of believers, we can't give up when we are asking God for something. Think about it. Put it in your mind. Think about what it is you're asking God for. Maybe it's a deliverance for a loved one who's unsaved, who doesn't know Christ is their personal savior. What do you do when you have a person that's not serving the Lord the way they should? Do we just give up on them and not care what happens to them? You know, I had a friend of mine who shared with me that how she had an uncle who was addicted to drugs. And as long as her father was alive, 
he was constantly in and out, you know, of drug rehab places. Con my, her father was constantly giving him money, constantly trying to help him, constantly trying to rehabilitate him. But the brother just would never fall into place, was always falling apart, always relapsing. Finally, her father died. And you know what ended up happening? Her uncle ended up turning his life around, quit cold turkey, and, you know, ended up now he's serving the Lord, doing all the things he needs to do. He is back in his right man, mind. You know why? Because of that, and this was going on for years, maybe 30, 40 years. Her father passed away, and now her uncle is just doing what he's supposed to do all because of prayer. And that what she was encouraging me, she was like, I know that you have a loved one who is battling addictions and things of that nature. And she was saying, don't give up on them. Never stop praying for them. Never be stop believing God for their breakthrough. I want to encourage you as a body of believers, no matter how rough it gets, no matter how much the enemy is fighting, and no matter how much the enemy is trying to keep you from your blessing, don't give up on God. Continue to press on. Continue to pray. Continue to fast. I know we're over the fasting season, but the scripture says that this kind cometh not out but by prayer and fasting. And God is wanting us to recognize as a body of believers that we have to continue to fast. We have to continue to pray. We have to continue to seek God with our whole heart and not grow weary with well-doing because the enemy will use whatever he can to keep us from serving the Lord and keep us from our blessing and all the things that God has for us. If you notice with the widow, she continued to press and press and press and press and press until she got her breakthrough. Even I've shared this with my Wednesday night class. Tell me something. You all, how many of you know what a size a ton is? Anybody know what a the ton, ton is? It's pretty, pretty heavy, right? Imagine like a big ton weight hanging from the ceiling. Okay, now imagine a ping pong ball hanging from the ceiling. Do you think a ping pong ball can move a ton? How many say yes, it can? How many of you say no, it can't? How many of you don't care? <laughs> okay, <laughs> thank you, I appreciate your honesty. Okay, so here, imagine the scientists, what they did was they took a ping pong ball and they actually set it to rock continuously and just hit this one ton weight. And they just wanted to see what was gonna happen. So they watched, and they watched this ping pong ball as it was constantly hitting the one ton weight. Guess what happened? Nothing, you're right. It just, that ton, that big ton <laughs> was just hanging from the ceiling and it was not moving one bit, one inch or anything like that. And so this ball, they said, let's just leave it and let's watch it. And day after day, they just kept watching this ping pong ball as it kept hitting this one ton weight. And guess what happened? It didn't move. And they kept watching it day after day and day after day until one day the scientists, you know, they actually some of them forgot about it. They forgot this experiment. But one scientist actually happened by one day. It's like he, he looked and he looked and he had to study it for a minute and they saw a slight movement of the one ton weight. And he called the other scientists over to watch. And so they started to watch. And after a while, this one ton weight was starting to move slowly. At first it wasn't, you couldn't even tell it was moving, but it was moving slowly. This little ping pong, everybody have an idea of a ping pong ball? It's like a thing like this size. And everybody knows what a one ton weight is. So imagine it's like trying to move an elevator with a ping pong ball. And so here you have this ping pong ball constantly knocking until all of a sudden, after a while, the one ton weight was moving in tandem with the ping pong ball. So it was like swinging at the same time. What's the point, Sister Melissa? The point is, is that that's how our prayers are. It's like that ping pong ball. You keep hitting it and hitting that, that unmovable prayer request. It may be that unsaved loved one. It may be that mortgage debt. It may be that credit card debt. It may be the car loan debt. It may be the wayward children. It may be a husband that's wayward. It may be a job situation that you can't control, but you continue to pray 
spray, just like that ping pong ball, kept hitting that one ton weight. You see, a one ton weight is an unmovable object, like a rock. And what does the word of God say? If we have faith as a grain of a mustard seed, and we believe God, guess what? That big rock, that mountain can be moved into sea. How can a mountain be moved into the sea? Just like that ping pong ball that constantly kept hitting that one ton weight day after day, week after week. That's how our prayers are. Day after day, week after week, month after month. We keep praying. We keep asking God. We keep pleading. We keep asking God. We keep petitioning. We keep asking God. And then one day, all of a sudden, that prayer request, that unmovable object, that unsaved loved one, that saved, that debt is removed. All of those things that we've been asking for are suddenly moved. Why? Because the fact that we don't stop fasting. We don't stop praying. We don't stop interceding. We don't stop believing. We continue to ask God and continue to petition until he moves on our request. You see, many times we give up too soon. We give up too quickly. We're like the scientist who looks and says, oh, that ball keeps moving over and over again, but it's not doing anything. Let's just give up. But the key is to continue to pray and continue to fast and continue to seek God until that breakthrough comes. There may be an unmovable object in your life that seems like it's not moving. And no matter how much you pray, no matter how much you fast, no matter how much you read, no matter how much you speak to that situation, it's not moving. But you got to believe with all of your heart. What does the word of God say? Jesus said, if my well, if, I, if you notice over in the passage, Jesus asked, will I have such faith? Will I find such faith in Israel? Read what it says. He says, really, will I find faith on the earth? like this woman who was before the judge constantly petitioning him about her prayer request. You see, the judge, the woman got her breakthrough, not because of the fact that she was beautiful, not because of the fact that she was smart, not because of the fact she was cunning. The reason she got her breakthrough was because she was persistent. She was persistent in her fasting. She was persistent in her praying. The word of God commissions us as a body of believers that we have to be consistent in our prayer. We have to pray without ceasing. We have to continue to petition God for our prayer requests. We can't get weary with well-doing. We can't give up. We can't throw in the towel and say, oh, well, this is how it's always going to be. No, it doesn't have to be that way. We can make the change. We can see God move in a powerful way. But how are we going to see this happen? When we come to a place as a body of believers that we don't sit and allow the enemy to run rough shot over our lives. Amen. We have to come to a place where we stand up and take authority in Jesus name and recognize who we are in him because we are fearfully and wonderfully made in his image and likeness. Amen. We are more than conquerors through him who loves us and are called to his service. We can do all things through Christ who strengthens us. Amen. It's not by might. It's not by power, but by his spirit, saith the Lord. We can speak to the mountain and the mountain will be moved. We can speak to that one ton way and it will move. We can speak to that unmovable situation in our lives and say, be thou moved in the name of Jesus and trust and believe that God will move that situation. But we have to believe. We have to be like the child who will not stop bothering their parents until they get their prayer request. We have to believe that God is going to do exceedingly, abundantly, above all we could ask or even think according to the power that worketh within us. How many of you believe, amen, that he can do the impossible? How many of you can believe that he can do great things? How many of you believe that he can do exceedingly, abundantly, above all you can ask or think? How many of you believe? How many of you, where is faith? Is there faith when God comes back to this earth? Will he find faith in Odenton? Will he find faith on the earth? Like the woman who crawled to her blessing. Do you remember the woman with the issue of blood? Do you remember her issue? She bled for 12 years, and she did not get her breakthrough in year one, or two, or three, or four. 
but she kept praying and she kept believing day five year five came and she was still bleeding but she believed God year six came she was still bleeding but she still believed God year seven came and she was still believing and then came eight year eight came and she still believed God then came nine now year nine is coming around she's still going to doctors she's paying all this money and things still aren't changing she's still bleeding she's still struggling but guess what year 11 comes she doesn't give up she continues to give money she continues to seek doctors she continues to believe but guess what no healing comes and year 12 comes and year 12 comes and she hears about a man who can heal her and guess what she says she's not going to sit down she's not going to give any more money to the doctors she's not going to give any more money to anybody else she crawls her way over to the maker and she gets down on her knees and guess what she does not rest until she get people are stepping on her she doesn't care she's getting her breakthrough people are laughing at her she doesn't care she gets her breakthrough she crawls and crawls and crawls until guess what she gets her breakthrough amen she got her healing amen blind Bartimaeus the people told him be quiet remember that he stood there in the crowd and they looked at him and they said be quiet blind Bartimaeus nobody cares about what's going on with you but guess what he cried all the more they said be quiet he cried all the more no matter how much they kept trying to quiet him he kept crying all the more you see the enemy tries to steal your joy he tries to steal your voice he get you know you ever been so broken so beaten that you can't even speak anymore you can't even talk anymore you'd rather throw the blanket over your head and just bury yourself under the covers than deal with this situation but blind Bartimaeus he heard about a man amen not just any man but the man who could heal him in the name Lord Jesus and what does he do he decides he's gonna get up and he's gonna go over and he's gonna find out about this man and he's gonna get his breakthrough and his friends are telling him be quiet blind Bartimaeus nobody hears you and guess what he hears the man of God is and he says Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. And guess what? They said, be quiet, be quiet. He said, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. They're telling him to be quiet. He said, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. And guess what? He got his breakthrough, amen? You see, the enemy will try to quiet you and silence you and tell you to be quiet, to continue to stay in your situation. But you have to quiet, you have to speak out. You can't be quiet when God is in the place. You cannot just sit and stay Day and be in a place of constant um, um just uh, just of uh, disarray but you have to come to a place where you break through the situation and you say what you know what I'm not gonna let you go until God you bless me if you notice with Jacob he wrestled with the angel all night he isn't interested in sleep you sleep you miss your blessing he was up he was at the fourth watch ready to get his blessing amen and that's how we have to be we have to be up and ready to receive see what it is God has for us I want to encourage you as a body of believers today don't sleep on your blessing don't miss the opportunity don't miss what God is wanting to do in you and through you don't let the enemy silence you and get you to a place where you feel you can't speak or you can't talk or you can't call out or you can't reach out and cry out to God cry out to God with your whole heart speak to him tell him what you need don't give up don't grow weary let God find faith on in over him. Let him find it in your area. Let him find it in your church, in your home. Tonight when you go before the Lord, even when you leave this place, I want to encourage you that prayer request that you have that you're seeking God for, don't give up on that prayer request. Continue to go before God. Continue to be persistent. Be childlike in your faith. Nag him. Beg him. Plead him. Crawl to him. Do whatever it is you need to do to get your blessing. But get your blessing amen get your blessing don't let the enemy rob you another day get your blessing go and get your blessing get everything that God has for you what God has for you is for you amen what he has for you is for you get your blessing get your blessing get your blessing amen amen Amen. 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 Get your blessing. Amen. Get your 
your blessing. Don't let the enemy rob you. Get your blessing. Amen. 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 Get your blessing. 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 I was I was I Glory to your name, O oh God. Glory to your name, O oh God. Glory to your name, O oh God. We bless you, O oh God, for you're worthy, O oh God. We bless you, O oh God. We honor you, O oh God. We thank you, O oh God, because you are God. We honor you, Lord God, because you're worthy, you're worthy, you're worthy. We thank you for your word today. You're good, you're good, you're good, you're good. You're better than we deserve, Lord God. And I just bless you, Lord God, and honor you today, Lord God. We thank you for your visitation. We thank you, Lord God, for coming before us today, Lord God. We thank you for visitation. Thank you, Lord God, for coming, Lord God, in the name of Jesus. Thank you, O oh God. 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 Thank you. If there's anybody here who is believing God for the impossible, I want to encourage you to come to the altar. Only you know what it is that you're seeking God for. This is not something that I can pray you through. Only God can, but you have to come and believe him for your breakthrough. <laughs>